We read from Deuteronomy 28. I'll read verse 1. We are going to read together in unison, on me and you. From verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, verse 8. Then you guys, you stop on verse 8. And I will proceed with reading. Deuteronomy 28, I read. Mine is the subheading, Blessings on Obedience. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations on the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Verse 3. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall you of fruits of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, the offsprings of your flocks. Blessed shall you... The Lord will cause your enemies... In seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing. Okay, we have a D right now. Let's start again. <laughs> Everybody has gone to school here. We can read in unison well. I'll start again. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I have commanded you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all the blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Verse 3, blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruits of your body. The produce of your ground. And the increase of your herds. The increase of your cattle. And the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall your basket. Blessed shall you be when you come in. And blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies. The Lord will command the blessing. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself. Just as he has sworn to you. If you keep the commandments of the Lord your God. And walk in his ways. Then all peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, in the produce of your ground, in the land in which the Lord swore by your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hands. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will give you, will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not beneath. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today and are careful to observe them, you shall not turn aside from, my, from any of my words which I have commanded you to this day, either to the right or to the left, or to go after other gods to serve them. The word of the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just want to thank you. Your children have gathered. We have all gathered to worship you. We have gathered in the name of Yahweh, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. 
We have gathered, oh, Father, under the Ruach, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, who is inside of us. For we are not as orphans. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. He comforts us. He teaches us. He instructs us. He corrects us. He rebukes us. He walks with us in all righteousness. So we just want to thank you, Father, that your children have gathered to hear your voice, to hear your word. Let it not be about me this moment, Father. I declare that it's about you, O oh God. I ask you, Father, that speak to your children at a personal level. Lord, if there is need, instruct those who need instruction or inspire those who need inspiration. Encourage those who need encouragement. Correct those who need correction. Rebuke those who need rebuking, O oh, Father. Touch them in the level where they are so that you can take them oh father from glory to glory to glory you want them to be the head and not the tail you want them to be above and not below you want them oh father to lend to many nations and not to borrow you want to bless them indeed so i thank you father that speak right now spirit of the living god just use me as a vessel for what can i be except a vessel you are the word you are the one who died for us jesus you are the one who redeemed us you are the one who purchased us by your blood. We are just vessels, oh God, I pray if you will make me a vessel of honor so that I can declare your truth to your children and with this word may you heal those who need healing. May you touch those who need to be touched. Those who haven't received you who are still struggling to know or to understand Christ Jesus. May you touch their hearts this morning. Those who are worshiping with us in live stream, I ask you Father to go to every house, to go to every room, oh Father, go to every heart that is listening right now. Even those who are going to listen to this live stream later, touch them at that moment. May your Holy Spirit be with us. We thank you, Lord, and we bless your holy name, and we glorify your name. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen and amen. I'm looking at the time. Okay, good. <coughs> I hear that by the end of the service, there is some food that is going to be delivered here. Am I correct? Uh, there is some food that is going to be delivered here uh, for people just to quickly um, munch something before we leave. <laughs> just look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, <laughs> I come for this munching today. <clears throat> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I just heard this. I, I didn't plan anything. I didn't do anything. I just heard, and I just become excited, and I was really looking forward to come to church today. Today, I'm going to speak on tapping into God's economy, part one. Tapping into God's economy, part one. And the part one would be the keys to financial success. The keys to financial success. Before I get into the keys of financial success, I just want to start by thanking everybody to come to the house of the Lord. I know it's not easy to come to the house of the Lord. If there's one warfare that you go through in life, it's to come to the house of the Lord. Because the enemy does not want you to be at the right place at the right time so that you can get a blessing. The enemy will cause you to, oh, to be frantic on, on Saturday. Oh my goodness, I have an assignment which is due on Monday. I can't, you know, I can't do anything. You know, or, or you know, I need to talk to to someone back home. It, it will be one o'clock, or it will be twelve o'clock, so I can't go to church. You know, there is always one hundred one reason not to come to the house of the Lord. Even those who are worshiping on live stream, some of them they are on their bed, but they come late. <laughs> I, I'm serious. I'm not even trying to joke. By the time that they open, we have read the Bible, we have already started preaching, and they'll be like, "What are they talking about today?" But they are home. They are on the computer, but they are late. Because just getting to the word of God is a warfare. It's a warfare. So I just want to thank you uh, for giving. You have given your time. For you to be here, it means that this, what is here, is important to you. And if it is important to you, may the Lord remember you for that. Yeah. I want to also thank uh, the present worshippers. I don't do this as often. The, the ushers, we come over here, it's clean and everything is taken care of. There are people who come here Friday to clean, Saturday to clean, do stuff. We just come and just enjoy an environment. I want to thank those people. The present worshippers, 
uh, the media, they always meet to rehearse, and they give us always a, a high every, every Sunday. You know, if I come even gloomy or whatever, the sooner I come to the house of the Lord, the praise that is happening here, if it does, that does not encourage you. If that, I mean, if, if, if what happens here does not encourage you, I want you on your own just to put your right hand on your chest and say, you demon that is inside of me, come out. I no longer need you. Because what happens you here is good. What happens here is good. So I just want to thank you for, for your time. Uh, I know we have intercessors who are always interceding. They are in the background praying, fasting, and just uh, for everything to go well in our lives. I, I just want to thank all those people. We have people who take care of children. That's not a small thing. They want also to be here and enjoying the word and everything else. But they are busy taking care of what? Of the children. May the Lord bless them. May the Lord bless them. I want to also thank you for especially those people who have given us the expertise. Uh, there are people who take pictures. We are people who, who play drums. If I can ask anyone to come and play the drums and the guitar, can you come and do that? Probably not. So we just want to thank those expertise, those are in media, and everything that you do in the house of the Lord. May the Lord bless you. Uh, you know, we have uh, Instagram and other uh, gram things that are happening in the background. I just want to thank you for all that expertise. May the Lord bless the work of your hands. I want to thank you uh, for your finances, giving to the house of the Lord, so that there's enough food in the house of the Lord. Uh, incidentally, we are going to munch something at the end of the day, right? There's enough food literary or enough food spiritually in the house of the Lord. Thank you for your giving. May the Lord reward you. And the last, I want to pray, I thank you for your prayers. The prayers that you pray, especially the prayers that you pray for us pastors. Pastor Paul, Pastor Helen, Pastor Dumisa, uh, Pastor me. Thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you so much for those prayers. I'm serious, we need your prayers. We need your, your prayers. Paul always say, please pray for me so that I can declare this word with boldness. Please pray for me so that I can have safe passage. Please pray for me. Not only Paul. Jesus at one time, he says to Peter, John, James, can you not tarry for an hour? Pray for me. Listen to me. If Jesus needs prayer, I need prayer all. So please pray for me. Honestly, if you're a person who come to this place or worship with us on live stream. I know we have people in Canada. We have people in the UK. I know we have people in, in, in South Africa. I know a lot of people. We have a good number of people from India. I've never been to India. who are worshiping with us through live stream. Please pray for us. And we pray for you also. Tapping into God's economy, keys to financial success. Every door... He has a key to unlock the door and to allow access to the house. Actually, this year, uh, 5784, according to the Hebrew calendar, uh, it is the year of pay delete, the year of the door. So every door needs a key to be opened. I will declare more of this message of this year, which is now will be 2024 in the cross overnight about the doors of this coming season that are ahead of us. The keys to your doors are so important that if you lose them, you cannot enter your house. There is a key to your car. There is your key to your apartment or to your house. There is your key even to this church. You may be the first one to arrive at this door, but if you don't have the keys, you cannot enter. So keys are so important. If you just leave right now to rush to your car and you want to dash out, and if you realize that you don't have keys, you have to come back. Because you cannot go anywhere without keys. Without keys, we are barred from access. Without these keys, we cannot enter and enjoy these spaces. Keys represent authority to unlock and to lock. Jesus says, I have given you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth, whatever you lock is unlocked. Whatever you unlock is unlocked. We have been given the keys of the kingdom. I just, normally I don't do this often, uh, but when I'm too excited, sometimes I just uh, say what I, I want to say and allow me. I had a dream last night. 
which had something to do with keys. And there is someone who's sitting in the back. I was talking with you about to graduate with your doctorate. I was talking with you, and uh, you said you wanted keys. And I said, where is your, 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 your chair of your department? And you say, oh, I, I, I can call the chair of the department. I said, oh, let me call the chair of your department. And we called the chair of the department outside Worth Pickle. And she came, and I, I, I asked her, do you have keys for this lady? And she said, oh, yeah, I, I can give you keys talking to me. I said, no, 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 I have keys already. But do you have keys for this lady? And he says, yes. And this lady was given keys. Those who are spiritually, they say hallelujah because they know what has happened. Someone has already been given what? Keys. Someone has been already been given authority. Someone has been given authority to unlock. I can tell that person that your job is already set up. And you are not going to struggle to be established because you have been given authority to unlock and authority to lock. I wanted to say your name, but let me not do that. Let me not do that right now. So keys represents authority. Keys represents access. Keys represents to enter in. I want you to know that the keys to salvation is not works. You can work good works as much as you want. You can give all your money, all your resources, even all your body to be, to be bent you still not go to heaven. Because the keys to salvation is not works. The keys to salvation is not even wealthy. You can give all your wealth and still go to hell. Because the going salvation is not to do with works or wealth. The keys to salvation is faith in Jesus. The keys to salvation is believing in your heart that Jesus is Lord and your Savior. Then confess with your mouth that Lord Jesus, come inside my heart, dwell inside with me, be my Lord and be my Savior. And at that point in time, you have unlocked and you end a salvation. So you can, I have seen people doing works and wealth and stuff like that. Those are keys for other things, but not salvation. Salvation is only in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you access it through faith in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus. So to access salvation, you need faith, not works. You cannot buy salvation with money. It is a gift of God that is accessed with faith in Christ Jesus. Let me bring another one. There is a five-pronged key to spiritual power. Five-pronged keys to spiritual power. You've seen people with authority who point at someone and the demon comes out, who speak something and it happens. And you'll be like, how did these people have this spiritual power? It's a five-pronged key. Number one, you have, for you to have spiritual power, you have to live a righteous life. There is what? Righteousness. Number two, you have to live a very prayerful life. Number three, you have to be also a person who fasts here and there. Or often. Number four, the gift that is upon you has to be activated. Activation of the gift. And the last one, you have to be a person who is very obedient. When God says, do this, you do that. When God says, do not do this, even if you wanted to do that, you don't do that. You walk by God and he trusts you. And when he trusts you, he now endow you with spiritual Power. Let me tell you, there was Paul and Silas, and they were praying with those brothers where they were fasting. Uh, and as they were praying and fasting, the Holy Spirit says, separate for me, Paul and Silas. And what did they do? They lay hands on them and they activate the gift which was upon them. And at that point in time, Paul and Silas are good to go because the, the, the spiritual power had been already unlocked upon them. If I had time, I would tell you the key to get married. I would tell you the key to get married. There is a key for that. I would tell you also the key to remain in marriage. Because getting married, you can get married anytime. But remaining in marriage until you are gray-haired. So there are keys for everything. But I don't want to talk about those keys right now. I don't want to excite anybody. 
What I want to talk about today is the key to accessing God's economy. In order to access God's economy, you need the right key. Without that key, you can love God so much, you can save God so much, but you can still be under the spirit of poverty. Have you ever seen people who love God so much, but they are so poor, and they so much lack, and they go to church on Wednesday, mid-service, on Friday, and on Saturday, and on Sunday, and they are doing a good thing, but they remain poor for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Because what they are doing opens other doors, but not a door to God's economy. It is because the key to financial success is not necessarily loving God or serving God. Biblically, the key to prosperity is found in the law of sowing and reaping. Can you say sowing and reaping? You must sow today if you want to reap tomorrow. You must sow today if you want to reap tomorrow. We have a small garden at our house, which is just like two meters long and two meters wide. Very tiny little garden. And during the summer, we sow tomatoes, onions, pepper, African okra. Uh, then someone started to be there, hey, let's put cilantro and rosemary. I thought rosemary is the name of a lady. Rosemary, cilantro, and all those things. We often do not buy those things from, I can say, end of June until October. We normally come and even give our friends the tomatoes. For some reason, from that little portion of land, there is a huge harvest that normally happens. Genesis 26, from verse 12 to 15, I believe. And one year... During famine, Isaac sowed and reaped a hundredfold, for the Lord blessed him. The man got richer by day until he was very wealthy. So the richness was incrementally until he became very rich. If Isaac did not sow, he was not going to reap. If Isaac looked at the drought because it was, there was famine in the land, if Isaac looked at the drought that there are no rains, he was not going to sow. And if Isaac did not sow, he was not going to reap. Isaac was going to be in luck. Isaac would suffer famine just as everyone else if you are busy looking at the weather and the weather forecast, you are not going to sow. We do not walk by sight. We walk by faith. So if you are a person who is very scientific and you are looking at the, the weather forecast and what they are saying, you are not going to sow. And if you are not going to sow, you are not going to reap. Isaac did not listen to the weather forecast people. Isaac knew that there was famine. Famine was affecting everybody in the land. But Isaac knew that there is a law of sowing and reaping. If I do not sow, I am not going to reap. So even if I lose my seed, I am going just to sow and ask the Lord to bless what I have sown. Isaac would love God so much. Isaac would have served God so much. If Isaac did not sow, Isaac was still going to be poor. Are you following me? Famine is luck. Famine is the spirit of poverty. Famine is a curse. In the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, there is no way where God said God gives them a blessing of famine. Famine is always what? A curse of lacking. But Isaac sowed in famine and ribbed hundredfold. If he ribbed tenfold, I was, it was impressive. If he ribbed twentyfold, I was like, wow. But he ribbed how much? Hundredfold in the time of famine. In the time of famine. Because Isaac understood the key to reaping is sowing. You sow in drought. 
and God multiply even in drought. No sowing, no reaping. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, no sowing, no reaping. You do not have to give when you have abundance. A lot of people, they think like, you know, I just have very little right now. It's not even enough for myself. Therefore, I do not have to sow it. I have just to hold on to it. I'll wait until one day when I'm a big ogre. Then I'll start to sow. Guess what? You may not be a big ogre. Because you did not sow. You only reap what you sow. The reason why generally in Bread of Life, you guys have been coming here to new people probably from August until now. You've never heard me preaching about giving, for an example. In a year, typically I preach giving once, except if the Holy Spirit asks me to preach about it once or two. The reason is that you have, re- you have heard every service. You have, I mean, you have heard every sermon on, pre- on giving. There's no, even if you're not a Christian, you have heard every sermon about what? Giving. So why should I tell you what you know already? So once in a year, just for us to be on the same baseline, I share the, 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 the economy of God and how to succeed in the Lord. A lot of people think that I have to wait until I have a lot, then I can give now. But when I have in drought, no, I can't give in drought. But that's what exactly Isaac did. He gave when it was in drought and he received it was in drought. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6, Apostle Paul says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but may God made it to grow or to increase. If Paul did not sow, Apollos would not have anything to water. God would not have anything to increase. Someone had to what? To sow the seed. Because God only bless what is already in the ground. He blesses what is what? In the ground. He only grows what is planted. In the realms of finances, sowing is giving. The promise of God is, if you sow or if you give, you reap or if you, you receive. And what you give comes back to you multiplied many times over. Giving is part of God's requirement. It is a God's commandment to his children. God himself is very generous. So he requires also his children to be as generous as God is generous. Imagine, if God was not generous, will you be sitting where you are sitting today? You come to this country, you get a GA, you get a TS, you get all those finances. Do you know that it's people who paid the taxes over generations, that money? Your father did not pay the tax in this country. And you come and you enjoy. And if you hear the statistics of how many people do not get a degree in this country, and you, you come from the corner of the world, and you come and access that which their fathers have paid for, And you still cannot say, Father, Lord, I thank you. Lord, what you've done is such a miracle to me. I bless you. You come from that corner of the world and you come and you end up getting one of a good job in engineering. One of a good job in whatever the area that you are going to be working in. God has opened those doors for you. He is generous. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, God is so generous. If he was not generous you'll be in your hometown. (laughs) God wants his children to be generous in every occasion. He wants his children to be generous in what? In every occasion. Because he wants to bless them in every occasion. He wants you to be generous in every occasion because he wants you to bless in every occasion. I'm not trying to hit my back. I'm just sharing stories. And I know the stories about me more than you, so I can share my stories. There is a day 
that um, we were driving with my children. They were very young. And, you know, we have a lot of homeless situation uh, in America right now. And you have an apartment. <laughs> People who are born here, they <laughs> good number of them, they are homeless. Thank God for that. And uh, I see a lot of homeless people here and there. We can give and if, if we impress to give. <clears throat> but I passed this man. He was quite well dressed. And I wouldn't think that that person was supposed to be begging. And it just bothered me. So I passed. We were going to shop. And we bought. I normally, when I go to shop, when I buy something and I use my card, I do not press where they say, do you want change? Like, do you want cash? Yeah, you can finish your money that way. I, don't, I normally don't do that. I don't say, no, I don't want any cash. But that day I hit, I needed this amount of cash because I was just bothered by that man. So I drove back and my children said, Daddy, where, where are you going? Because they knew that we were supposed to go the opposite side. They said, oh, don't worry, don't worry. I came and I parked there and I came out and I called that man and I started to talk to him. And I said, what is happening? Say, this was a white guy. What is happening? And he was very genuine. This is my situation. Things are like this. Things are like this. In my home, I was kicked out of home and blah, 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 blah. And I said, uh, I speak a blessing upon your life. I declare that your life is going to be in order. I declare that the Lord is going to bless you. But those words are good, but they are not enough. Right? If you see someone hungry and you speak or even you prophesy good things, someone needs food. That's what the Bible says. I gave him money. You remember that, right? He looked in my face with a shock. And he started to cry. And he hold on to me. And I said, it is well with you. My encouragement, find a church. Wherever you feel free to find a church. This Sunday, go to church. And things are going to be okay for you. And when I did that, it was not like a something extraordinary. We are supposed to be generous in every occasion. That's what the Bible say. I then come to work and there was something at work that needed to be given to someone. I thought I would be the last person in the list to get that, person, that thing. Therefore, I did not even ask for it. Others were what? Asking for it. I guess I order. I'm, I'm not going to bother myself. I don't want disappointment. So let me just leave it. And uh, I was called and say, oh, we have uh, this situation, this situation, and um, <clears throat> that we talked about in the last meeting. I, I wanted to check if you want this and that. I said, both? And says, yeah, we can give you both. It is that very same week. And that thing was equivalent to 14000 I gave that man $20. That very same week, God released something that I did not ask for. It was very difficult for me not to link those two things. They may not be linked. They may not have a correlation. But it was very difficult for me to not link those two things. That I had to go out of my way and bless someone who my spirit has been gripped that there's something going on on this person. This is not a person who's on drugs that I'm giving him money to use. Ah, no, no, no. This is a different case. And that very week, I was given something that I did not ask because I sowed. What did I do? I sowed. When we sow, we are going to receive and God is going to bless you. And if we had time, I would hear a lot of sowing that you do. And a lot of reaping that you do, I believe. Luke 6 verse 38 teaches us. Give and it shall be given to you. But I want you to know that you, you are not going to only receive what you have given. But it is going to be a good measure. It is going to be pressed down. It is going to be shaken together. And at the end of the day, it is going to be running over, and this will be poured onto your lap. This is going to be poured onto your lap. For with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. Many times 
over. You know, there's a part of the Bible that uh, nags me a little bit when the Bible says, he who gives sparingly will receive. And he who gives abundantly will receive. So in other words, the power is up to you. Actually, giving is up to you. If you choose to give sparingly, that's great. You are going to receive what? Sparingly. That's fair. If you choose to give abundantly, that's greatest. We are going to receive what? Abundantly. So when the power is in you, you need to make a very spiritual decision, a very faith-based decision, more than an intellect decision. Because we do not move by intellect, we move by faith. Look at your neighbor and just smile. Assuming you choose not to give at the first place, there will be nothing to be given back. There will be nothing to be pressed down. There will be nothing to be shaken together. There will be nothing to run over. There won't be any good measure because you did not give in the first place. Is that symbol? Is just that symbol? There is a year that um, we did not sow in our little garden. We decided to go home. So we packed our bags, all of us, and we said, Africa, here we come. And we went home. Oh, my goodness, the food back home is so good. I mean, when you go back home, you'll be like, goodness, if I could just take everything that I have in America and just enjoy it here, I would stay here. You know, when you eat the food here, these genetically modified foods, oh, Jesus. The food back home kills me. And that's one thing that I look forward to do to go home, besides to see my parents, is to binge eat. There's time for everything. <laughs> the year that we went home, we spent, I think, part of June, July, or something like that back home. And we came very late. So that year, we did not... Uh, so, I can tell you that that year we visited Kroger quite a number of times. Buying all those tomatoes and cilantro and the rosemaries that summer. And they were very expensive that summer. And I come to realize that it is as simple as that. If you sow, you reap. If you do not sow that year, you don't reap. It's only that in spiritual speaking, God is just very generous. And God is very... Ah, what's the word? A mess, full of mercy. That even when he is reigning, he can reign to the house of a murderer and also to the house of a priest. Just the mercy of what? Of God. It is just the mercy of God. But if you do not sow, you do not reap. So the key to reap is to sow. The key to receive is to give. Then the next question is, what do we give, pastor? Ah, you ask me that question. You have heard this sermon in any church that you have ever gone. But let me break it down for you. Number one, we give our first fruits. We give what? First fruits. Number two, we give our tithe. Number three, we give our offerings. And number four, we give alms. First fruits, tithe, offering, alms. Giving is part of worship. Giving is what, what? Part of worship. When we came over here, the part, first worship happens when the ushers were opening the doors and smiling at you and saying, welcome to the house of the Lord. May the Lord bless you. Does our usher smile? Are you sure? Yeah, thumbs up, ushers. I hear that you are, you are smiling. And you came in, you get settled. And now the present worship come. It was the next level of our worship. And they led us to come out of our minds and our worries and everything. And they take us into the spirit realm. And we worshipped God and we sang. Uh, those who have legs, they danced. Those who have hands, they clapped. And we enjoyed in the house of the Lord. And the next thing, we prayed for children and we released them. Then the next thing of our worship, we hear the word of God. And after that, 
we are going to go to the another level of worship, it is through giving. It is after that, we go to another level of worship, perhaps we give our testimonies or prayer requests. All that together is worship. Are you following? There is no one part that is more important than the other. All that is what? It is worship. So, giving is part of worship. Look at your neighbor say, neighbor, are you worshiping well? In the Old Testament, the Old Testament pictured drawing near to God as coming into the presence of a king. When you had an audience with the king, you always had to bring tribute. In other words, you had to bring a gift. No one would go to the king. I'm talking whether it's David or Solomon, empty-handed. So Exodus 23 verse 15 tells us that you cannot come before the king. And here it was talking about God, empty-handed. You cannot come before the king empty-handed. Can I put it in a different way? You cannot go to Walmart empty-handed. If you go to Walmart empty-handed, what happens? You come back what? Empty-handed. So it is God who was saying three times a year, all the men, I want them to come. But when they come to me, they cannot come to me empty-handed. Is it because God was in need? Was God needy that he wants people to bring something? No. God wants you have to sow so that he has a reason to bless you. You have to sow so that he has reason to bless you. And verse 16 of uh, Exodus 23 says, so you ought to bring your first fruits of the crops you sow in your field. So I'm going to start to talk about first fruits. Number one, what are first fruits? First fruits are the first portion of your harvest in a land. And when you see increase in your life, you would bring the first portion of that increase to the Lord to honor him for providing you. In the Old Testament, they brought the first portion of animals, crops, fruits to the temple. For the firstborns belongs to the Lord. And it needs to be consecrated unto the Lord. There are over 30 Bible verses that I just perused last night that talks about the first fruits. Proverbs 3 verse 9. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. So first fruits is all always about honor. It's always about what? About honor. Whenever you get an increase, you want to honor God for that increase. There is someone in my life that I really want to honor. There are times that I just do peace jobs, you know, somewhere, which is not my, my main job, just peace jobs. And whenever I get that money, I'm excited about that money, which is very little compared to the money perhaps that I'm getting from my ordinary work. And I want to bring that money to that person and honor that person with my increase. And I say, this one, you can just use it whatever you want. It is that work that I did for that, 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 that. I reviewed these book chapters and stuff like that, and they gave me this amount of money. And I just wanted just to honor you with that. And the person smiles. I don't really know what that was that person though. <laughs> so when God gives something to you, you want to honor who? God. And you go now to God and say, Lord, I was not expecting this. This just come as a surprise to me. This increase just come as a surprise to me. And I want to give the first fruits of it. Are you going to give the whole thing? No, the first fruits of it. Just part of it that you determine in your own heart. I just want to release this to you because you have given me this increase. Because you have given me this increase. Exodus 34 verse 26. You shall bring the very first, can you say very first, of the first fruits of your soil into the house of the Lord, your God. Romans 11 verse 16. 
Paul says, if the first piece of dough is holy, the lamp is also. If the root is holy, the branches are also. When God blesses the first fruits, the entire produce will be blessed too. This is the reason why Jesus went to heaven as the first fruit of those who come from the earth, who resurrected from the earth. And he secured holiness for all of us who are going to make it to go to heaven. He was the first fruit and the rest of us will be holy because the first fruit was holy. So when Israel brought the first fruits to the sanctuary, they, come, they were making a statement, we want to honor you, God. Our honor is you, God. The provider for everything else that we have is you, God. Even if we sow in famine, we reap. We know that science says you cannot reap, but we are reaping because it is you, God, who does that. Just as what we read. If you follow these commandments, I want you to make you the best of all people in the land. Specific first fruits. When people of Israel bring first fruits to the house of the Lord, what the first fruits were used for. Because everything that you give, it has its function and doors that it opens. Ezekiel 44 verse 30 is the answer. The first fruits of all, I mean the first of all your first fruits of every kind and every contribution, contribution is offering, and of every kind, from all your contributions, which is offerings, shall be for the priest. You shall also give the priest the first of your door to cause a blessing to rest upon you. So the end game of the first fruits is that a blessing will dwell in your house. A blessing will rest in your house. Let me tell you, the priests are servants of God. They work for God. So the person who is supposed to take care of them is who? Is God. God is supposed to be the one who pays the priest for the work that he has given them to do. But now God says, no, I want now you to just not give everything. Just only the first fruits. Pay for me to the priest that I've engaged in some work. Then when you do this, it's like you have paid my debt. And I'm going to bring a blessing upon you. But it's not a blessing that comes and go. It's a blessing that will come to rest in your house. Because, you know, we are so much used to type of blessing that comes and go. You know, you have money today. Three years down the line, you are borrowing. You don't have anything. The blessing did not come to dwell. The blessing come and go, come and go, come and go. When the blessing come and dwell, you are living in perpetual blessing. And there is such a thing as a perpetual blessing. As the people feed the priest who are working for God's work, which is ministering at the altar, God would reward the people with his blessing to rest on the houses of those people. And no one would be poor. In God's economy, no one should be poor. He wants everybody to have. That's how God's economy functions. If you take care of God's business, God will take extra care of your business and he will bless you. He will bless you. I wonder, are there any children of pastors here? Can you just stand up if you're a child of a pastor? Okay, I'm going to preach until I finish. You're going to be standing up. Yeah, you're just going to be standing up. <clears throat> Before I get to the part that I want to speak now, let me give a disclaimer. <clears throat> there is this suspicion that if a pastor is preaching about sowing and giving and stuff like that, he wants money from the congregation. So I'm going to give this disclaimer with a lot of humility. We have been running Bread of Life for the past 13, 14 years. We do not take salary from Bread of Life. All the pastors of Bread of Life, Pastor Paul, Pastor Helen, Pastor Dumisa, Pastor me, we, do, we are voluntary pastors. We are what? Voluntary pastors. 
everything that comes to bread of life, it comes to the storeroom of bread of life and it circulates accordingly. Are you following? It circulates what? Accordingly. But does the Bible say that? No, the Bible says we have right. Do not muzzle an ox while this is what? Trading. We have right to use whatever comes to us, but we have chosen not to. So we have, on, on our own, we just said, no, the Lord has blessed Pastor Paul so much, Pastor Dumisa so much, Pastor Helen so much, uh, Pastor Me so much. So whatever comes here is circulated back and is used accordingly. So I just want you to know that what I'm sharing, I am not sharing this to try to ask for money. Uh, PKs, are they called PKs? Pastor Skids. How are you? I think <laughs> you have been to church several times. When dad is going to church, you must be in church. And you must acti be active in church. You must participate in church. Yeah, I think all of you, you have to be able to play the piano. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm following you. You have to play the piano. You have to know how to play drums. You have to know how to do media. You have just to do that. Pastor's kids, sometimes you are treated very unfairly. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes you are treated very unfairly. Sometimes you are not given an opportunity to be yourself. Sometimes you are not given an opportunity to be young and also make mistakes and do whatever others are doing. Right? Because he's there. Pastor's kid. He should be a little pastor himself or herself. So pastor's kids sometimes, they can't go out with others and just dance and just enjoy themselves because they are a what? A pastor's kid. And I know that sometimes you start to grow and not like church. You know? Because you'll be like, church makes me not to be myself. But I also want to tell you that there's a benefit that is upon you. If there are people that have been prayed for more than anybody on earth is you. You have been prayed for, anointed. Sometimes we take the whole bottle of oil and just pour on them. May the Lord be with you. What I want to talk about now is the modern sentiment about giving in the house of the Lord. We feel that the priest, more than we call him pastor, must work a day job and take care of his family so that he does not burden the church finances. That's the modern sentiment. People feel like the pastor is not supposed to get anything from the church. But he's supposed to what? To work and work and work. But this some pastor who is working a day job, putting 50, 60 hours a week, he must minister at the altar on the sanctuary every Wednesday, mid-service every Friday, uh, another service on Sunday. He must preach with much power for us. He must do counseling whenever we need counseling. If I call you my pastor that I need some counseling and he doesn't come, he's not a good pastor. Uh, if I am in hospital giving birth, my pastor should be admitted to praying for me in the hospital. Uh, if I'm just sick, not even giving birth, if just sick and, and your pastor does not come to the hospital for five days, you're not going to be happy about that. We expect him to come to the hospital. Uh, when I have my baby shower on Saturday, he has to come to my Baby shower. But Sunday is supposed to also preach with power. He must do my premarital counseling all so that my marriage is going to thrive. We do premarital counseling in Bread of Life for six months. By the time that you get married, you're getting, supposed to get an honorary degree. <laughs> we have gone through every facet of marriage. We talk of finances, we talk of investments, we talk of characters, we talk of everything. We've gone through that. This pastor must also come to my graduation. Ah, it's an important day for me. And how many of you are going to graduate? Many. He is supposed to be there. He must, if I have visitors that have come from Africa, 
He must see those visitors. They cannot go without seeing my pastor. Oh, he must do that. He must also do baby dedication. That's his very good job. And at my wedding, he has to really plan, help planning my wedding. And he has to wear the nicest suit at my wedding. It's my wedding, oh. It has to look very good. And the pastor's wife, eh, he must dress the nicest at my graduation and at my wedding too. And he must speak very well. And he has to be very dignified. Uh, at my wedding, come one hour early, pastor, so that you can pray to overcome all the witches that want to destroy my marriage. Come, pastor, you have to be there early on him. He must fast and pray to have power to do deliverance in my life. And not only me, he also has to do deliverance for my people back home. Call them and pray for them, Pastor. Uh, he has to be there at the midweek service. Uh, he has to be there at the all night prayers. Uh, we, we just have to do that. Then the problem is these children. If this pastor is working 60 hours, plus doing all these things that I just speak a fraction of, when is time for this pastor to take care of MM? When is pastor there to take care of them? So you see that the pastor's children, they end up very bitter about ministry. Are you following me? They end up being what? Bitter about ministry. Because dad and mom were not there. Dad and mom were busy taking care of the whole flock, going to, 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 to baby showers and graduations and, and, and this and that, and they were not there for us. I want us to stretch our hands and pray for the pastor's kids right now. In the name of Jesus, stretch your hands, raise your hands towards them. Pray for them. Pray for these children, Father. If there's any root of bitterness that they have ever developed against them, oh, Father, just heal them right now by your spirit and by your blood so that they continue to love the Lord. They can continue to be in the house of the Lord and enjoying in the house of the Lord in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray for these children of pastors, oh, God, and all the attacks that comes against them, oh, Father, Yes, we nullify those attacks. We cancel them in the mighty name of Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus over the children of pastors. May you be merciful upon them. May you be merciful upon them, O Lord. May you be merciful upon them, O Lord. May they work the house of the Lord. As Solomon take over from his father, David, may they take over from their fathers and their mothers to continue doing the house of the Lord because they come from the Levites, O Lord, and you have blessed them in the order of Melchizedek. Be merciful to them and be gracious to them, O Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Pastor's kids, you can sit down. For now, let me just not give you more burden than you are given. So be yourself. Just be yourself. Live by the word. Yes, go with whatever your parents shape you to be. But do not be so much afraid. And you people be also fair. Right? If someone is 10 year old, leave them to be a what? A 10 year old. They are not a little pastor. Rumbi is not a little pastor, Dumisa. <laughs> right? She is what? Rumbi. And we just have to give them grace. The same way that we give all children grace. I'm saying this because probably I just have two years with you. And you are going to serve another pastor and another pastor. I remember at one time, our child Rumbi had a problem. Was crying a lot. We were still worshiping at the Holiday Inn. She was crying, I mean, in the service. And she was just not feeling well. And everybody would just at once just look at Pastor Dumisa. <laughs> Not even looking at the person who's crying. And the message is known. It's non-verbal message. Take your daughter out of here. We want to hear what? The message. I wouldn't think that someone would be like, Pastor, can I, can I just take your child and play with her out there so that you can also just rest and hear the word? Oh, no, 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 no. You, Pastor, take your child out. We want to hear the, We are unfair to pastors. 
We need to confess about that. This pastor who works 60 hours and who does all these things in the house of the Lord, he must not buy a new car. <laughs> you guys, what are you laughing? You are in trouble with me. I want to see everybody in the office. <laughs> If he buys a new house, we must know where did the money come from. His children must not go to private school. Public school is for everybody. <laughs> Let them go where everybody is going. Where are they getting the money from? And the children have to behave like little pastors. His wife must dress very well, show hospitality at all times, she must smile all the days of her life. <laughs> when I call my pastor or pastor's wife, they must answer on the first call. Ding, 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 ding. They must answer that time. Not to call me back later. I want to talk to you. That's the sentiment. Look at your neighbor and say to your neighbor, neighbor, don't do pastor's abuse. Yeah, there's child abuse, there's wife's abuse, there's also pastor abuse. Be a blessing to your pastors so that there is a blessing that comes upon you. And God will cause his blessing to rest upon your house. Number two, let me talk about tithe. My time is gone, um, but allow me to finish up after all food is coming. In God's economy, there is a tithe, which is 10% of your income that comes back to God's storehouse. Malachi 3 verse 6 to 12 tells us, verse 10 says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be enough food in my House, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out such blessing that there would be no room enough to store it or to receive it. If you want to catch God, catch him on his word. Because God honors his word more than anything. And that's the only time God says, test me. Because he knows that the power is in you. Power to give or not to give is up to what? To you. That's why he says, test me. Test me. You know, when I was, <coughs> uh, the children were young, we were, were, were bribing them to, to clean their rooms and stuff like that. I said, guys, uh, here's the deal. If you can clean your room and go to your bathroom and clean your bathroom and everything, you can ask me to eat in any restaurant and I will take you there. And I knew the restaurant, it was the one restaurant, it was Chick-fil-A. So I was okay. I was not going to be taken to Carnegie or, <laughs> or something like that. <clears throat> and they would say, Daddy, are, are you serious? Okay, that's your word. And I said, yes. They will run and they will clean. And I said, I have to come to, in to inspect then I come and inspect. I said, oh, how about that? Yeah, you didn't vacuum over there. And they did everything and when they finished. said, okay, honey, I'm going to take the girls to, to, to Chick-fil-A. And we go to Chick-fil-A. Oh, they are so happy. They start to smell Chick-fil-A like, you know, 20 minutes away. <laughs> <laughs> I say, I dare test me. If you do this, I'll do this for you. And every time that they did this, I did that for them. And God is saying, test me, church. Test me in your giving tithe and see if I will not open the floodgates. When it's called the floodgates, it's no longer one after the other. It is a flood that comes your way. What is the importance of tithe? Of, of, of our tithe? tithe is to test God's ability and God's capacity to give you. Is your God able to provide? 
test him with your tithe. Number two, I will rebuke the devourer or the pest from devouring your crops and your vines. In your fruits, we will not drop the fruits before they are ripe. If you get a job and you are there for six months and you lose the job, you lost the vines before they are ripe. If you have a relationship for three years and you end up breaking up before you get married, the vines have been scattered before they are ripe because they did not lead to the end result. And he says, no, if you give your tithe, I'll make sure that whatever you sow will come to full riping. Are you following? So when you give tithe, God is going to rebuke the devourer. Let me tell you stories. Oh my goodness, my time. Um, I know someone that I prayed with. He says, Pastor, I get a job. I, I struggle to get a job. When I finally get a job, I said, woohoo, God has given me a job. I'm going to do so well at this job. Then I buy a car. Then the car will have an accident. Whatever I have gathered and gathered and gathered, in one moment, I can, it can just what? Scatter. And he says, so this person has moved from one region to the other, was a teacher also. And he says, whenever I buy my bed and my wardrobe and my fridge and whatever, and one weekend I just travel to go somewhere, the thieves will come and wipe the whole house. The devourer. And that person, we had to do deliverance with that person. And when we did deliverance with that person, that problem stopped. And I'm going to leave it there because there's something that happened later on. The devourer does not say don't gather. Gather as much as you want. The devourer will wait after you have gathered in order to scatter. So the devourer will not say don't have a degree. Have that degree. But the devourer is going to make sure that during your whole OPT you don't get anything. The devourer will not say, you know, I don't, don't get promotion. You know, some people, the problem starts when they get promotion. When they are just working at their own level, oh, no problem, they are doing well. The sooner promotion comes, that's the, where the problem starts. If you give your tithe to me, I will make sure that I'll bar the devourer. Oh, Lord, every devourer in my life catch fire. Lose word and live my life. And he says, and, I will, and you will live delightful in your land. And you live delightful in your land. There is a part which says, give the whole tithe. That's what the, the Bible says. Give the what? The whole tithe. God is used words with a reason. Not giving the whole tithe is a God robbing spirit. That's why he says, you rob me. And yet you say, how can a man rob God? You rob me in what? Tithe. Because God knows that it's within your power. Your tithe is $100. But you can just choose to say, I'm going to give 60. Did you give your tithe? You get it? That's why he says, give the war tithe. There's a reason for that. He knew that a lot of people do not want to give the war tithe. Can, you, can I say something in a very nice way? We are wicked. We are wicked because when we want a job, we pray, we fast, we go to pastor, we kneel down, we need the oil, we need to go to the interview, and God gives you a wonderful job. And you go to God and say, I will not give you the water. Just 10%, 90% is yours. The heart of man is not good. Because God blesses us so much. And instead of just saying, Lord, I'm testing you on this. I'm, I'm just what? Testing you on this. He says, test me. And he says, give me the whole time. In, in, you know, I say, if God had said 90% give to the house of the Lord, 10% is yours. Ah, churches will be empty. Or <laughs> people will be grouch. But he says, 90% is yours. Use it whatever you want. Just the 10%. Give me to my storehouse. And I will make sure that the devourer 
will not come upon you. I was talking with this lady. She challenged me. Um, she gave her first fruits, tithes, offerings, alms, and stuff. And she says, Pastor Arnold, uh, I had a, an accident. She drove a big Cadillac. And says, I had an accident. And I was angry at the devourer. Because I know that just for them to fix the back of that Cadillac, it will cost a lot of money. And I said, God, I give my tithe. The devourer has come to do devouring. I declare that the devourer must pay back. Because he was hit from, she was hit from the back. Uh, she went to the insurance and said to the insurance, uh, you know, my car is still new. This is what has happened. I do not want you to fix my car. I would want to get a quotation of my car. And because of the time that you are going to inconvenience me, it has to be paid for. So I'm going to negotiate with you. If you don't want to negotiate with me, I'm, my lawyer is going to talk to you. They say, no, 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 you don't have to involve your lawyer. Let's just talk. And he says, tell us how much do you want? And he says, you know, um, I would need at least 60000 If they had gone to John's Bro, board shop, they would fix that thing for 10000 But she says she wants how much? 60000 I want 60000 And she says, no problem. We'll give you your 60000 I think Cadillac is somewhere around 60000 So basically, they gave you a new Cadillac. Because she says, Lord, I give you my Test me on this. Let me finish up. Am I going to finish up? I really, really, really wanted to finish up. Probably I can just move through. Um, bring to my storehouse. And where is your storehouse? Bring the whole tithe. Because he knows that people don't give the whole tithe. If they give part of the tithe. So you do part of the worship. And sometimes we outsource our tithe and we do what we call pay per prophecy. We do what? Pay per prophecy. God says bring to the storehouse. Where is your storehouse? Where is your storehouse? Where do you worship? Where is your church? That's where you bring your Tithe, the whole tithe to the storehouse where you worship. You know what people do? They say, I am going to give, my tithe is $100. I'm just going to give $20. Then I'm going to call Pastor Kweku in Ghana. And I'm going to say, oh, Pastor, and this and this and this, and Pastor is going to prophesy me and good prophecy. That's pay, pay, pay prophecy. And, uh, but there's also, uh, you know, I don't have a Nigerian name, I'm sorry. I wanted to <laughs> Pastor Shola, Shola Shade or something like that. <laughs> he is in Maryland. And I call Pastor Shola Shade and say, oh, my, you know, my, my courses and blah, blah. Pastor Shola Shade, I, I, I send him money and, you know, so I break that tithe into little, little parts. And I give, yeah, I give, yeah. but I'm giving. Am I not giving? I have given. But God does not care about just giving. He cares about giving right. Are you following? He cares about give. He says, bring to my storeroom. Pastor Shonashade is not the storeroom. The storeroom is the house of the Lord. So that there is enough here. Let me tell you what has happened in the past. And I'm saying this with humility. People have gone through very tough times financially, and the church has shipped in. People, I cannot tell you how many times people call me and say, they are going to page me this afternoon. I need a thousand dollars, otherwise I'm going to be paged. And I know this is an international student. When you are paged, what's going to happen? You're out of status, you're going home. And I just said, you know what? This is an 11th hour situation. We pay. Surprisingly, the very same person that he was paid for, finally get a GA, never bring a cent to the storehouse. That's a poverty spirit. 
He's giving you a shade for prayer. Pay, pay, pray, pay, prophets. Pay, pay, prophets. God wants your prophets to come from your house. And sometimes you don't even need to be prophesied. Sometimes we just declare that everybody who's under my voice here, yeah, may the Lord propel you. It's enough. You don't need someone who lies to you, who tells you, who threatens you, lies to you and stuff like that. Because that's what's happening. I'm going to preach about pastors one day. Hey, what's happening in the Christian dome is scary. So no paper prophets. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, bring to the storeroom. Do not do paper prophecy. In, my, in the time that I've done ministry, I've told at least three to four people that please don't send your money here. Give it where you're worshipping. In the house where you're worshipping. And that lady, one, one of the ladies was protested. He said, no, pastor, I want to give to you. I said, no. Tithe, give it where you are worshipping. If you want to give an offering and you have an increase here and then you want to bless us, feel free. But tithe, give where you are your worship. Because if you have an accident today, who is coming to the hospital? He is not Pastor Shorashade. It is Pastor Paul. He has to drive to come to the hospital. He has to drive to come to places. He has to take care of his, he to dedicate the children. He has to pray for your children. He has to do deliverance. He is the one who is doing it. So why are you giving over there your tithe and not to the house of the Lord? That's why in God's economy, you give and give and give and give, but you do not be blessed because God looks at the intention of the heart. God cares about motive more than action. Are you following me? Because I can do a mistaken action, but my heart was okay. And God looks at me and says, oh no, it's okay. I, he has made a mistake, but it's okay. So may make sure that your intentions are clear. I'm finishing up, but I don't want to finish up in such a knot. I wanted to finish up on a higher knot, on something that is, that is good. I want to encourage you because I've been a pastor for a little bit, over a decade. I have a lot of pastor's friends. I have pastor's friends who are 80 years old. And when I talk to them, they complain. Says, Pastor, um, <clears throat> one of my pastor's friends in Maryland says, this guy could not get a job. I fasted. I made sure that the Lord would open the door. When this guy went to, to an interview, the pastor went with him. And the pastor was outside the interview and was walking around the building praying. And this guy got a job which was 160,000. He was in the IT area. 100 what? 60,000. It's a small church of this pastor, and this pastor is such a shepherd. He loves people. I know him. He's my friend. He loves people. He prays for people. Sometimes I say, oh, pastor, I'm not going to talk to you for the next 15 days. I am fasting over this, 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 this. So pray with me in agreement. That's how much he loves people. And this person, this guy, works in the church. And this guy uh, is the instrumentalist in the church and was also in charge of the, what do you call it, the website and stuff like that. This guy stayed in this church for a year and he never paid a cent in his tithe. Even though the pastor had to go with him and when the pastor called him and said, what's happening? You have never given for all this time. I never called you. I wanted you to be convicted by God. The guy says, I'm leaving. And he left the church. <clears throat> That's what it happened recently. He left the church. That's when I said, that's a, not only a God-robbing spirit, but that's a spirit of poverty. I know for one sure one thing, he is going to lose that job within six months. And when you lose that job within six months, where is he going to come back to? Let's stand up and pray. Is food here? Okay, let's stand up and pray. I'm talking about God's economy and how it functions, Right? I'm talking about God's economy and how it functions. If you want to get your degree, you're going to register, you're going to enroll, you're going to go to classes, you're going to study, you're going to do assignments. At the end of the day, you're going to get your degree. If you don't do these things, you will not get your degree, but you are enrolled. Right? So in God's economy, it functions in a certain way. And I'm just laying it down for you. 
And uh, probably I'm helping the next, your next pastor two years down the line when you graduate because you're not going to be here forever. Right? So that you know that you, you need to support the work of God in the way that God says support it and the blessing comes your way. We want to pray just for two minutes and prepare to give in the house of the Lord. If those who are giving tithe, give the whole tithe to the storeroom. Can I have one? Thank you, Jesus. We are going to give a wave offering today. So I'll give you one minute to prepare. One minute to prepare in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Are you ready? We are going to give a wave offering today. We are going to give a wave offering today. Those who are going to give online, can you put the information online? Media. Okay, those who are going to give online, you can give online. If this is your house, this is where you worship every Sunday online. Yes, this is your house. So bring to the house of the Lord so that the blessing comes your way, those who are online. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Forever and ever, I will love you. In Jesus' name. Let's just wave what we are going to give. Father, this morning we are going to give a wave offering before you. Because we feel in the spirit that there's a wave offering for the new year. And as we give this new year, Father, the pay year of pay delete, we are pleading the blood of Jesus over our giving. Look at them who are giving the whole tithe, oh God. Look at them who are giving an offering, oh Father. Look at them, oh Lord, who are giving the first fruits unto the house of the Lord. Even as they wave before you, Father, we are testing you. For you say, test me on this and see if I will not open the, 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 the gates of heaven that I flood you with blessings that you don't have even enough room. So I declare right now that your children who are giving this morning, they will not lack. They will not lack. And that next interview, oh Father, where yes, when they, they diagnosed with that sickness, oh Father, healing is expedited. Yeah, the paperwork, Father, is expedited. Whatever to do with them, the relocation is expedited. For when you when we give, you don't give us only what we have given you, but you press it down, you shake it over, it runs over, you give a good measure. I'm teaching your children the truth and I know that the truth is sometimes can be heavy but I'm speaking the truth to your children father in the name of Jesus that as they give to the house of the Lord may they never lack may they never lack because this is a promise that you have given us in the mighty name of Jesus we thank you Lord and we bless your holy name in Jesus name we pray amen and amen I know some people you don't have anything you don't have to give anything. You don't have to feel bad about it. Enjoy in the house of the Lord. If the Lord hasn't blessed you, no problem. But when he blesses you, bless the Lord. And those who cannot give anything, I don't want you to raise your hand. But for the sake of those, I want everybody to just put your right hand on your chest besides the musicians. Put your right hand on your chest. Father, I pray not for everybody, but for those who don't have anything to give in the house of the Lord. Those who come to the house of the Lord empty-handed. That's the one I'm praying for right now. Lord, whatever has caused lack in their lives, I pray that break that devourer and break that lack. May you test them by providing to them and see if they are going to bring the whole tithe into the house of the Lord and see if they are going to bring the offerings unto the house of the Lord and the first fruits unto the house of the Lord. And when they do that, Father, bless them even more. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray for those who do not.
provide for them. I thank you, Father, and I bless your holy name and I glorify your name in Jesus' name. Brother James. <laughs>